Chancellor Bowles, Professor Brent Rapp gave a wonderful lecture here on America's Roman heritage. She described how after the American-led invasions of Afghanistan in Iraq, there's been much talk about America as a new role. More recently, there are also concerns about America facing the challenge of rising new China. The, political, the world political situation today somehow resembled 2,000 years ago, when the Roman Empire and the Chinese empires were the superpowers in the Western and Eastern worlds, respectively. These two were among the greatest empires in world history. They left rich and influential legacies, which are like cultural genes that pass through the ages. America is called a new role for good reasons, and the new China have retained many uh, traditional traits. Because of the rich legacies, the histories of the ancient empires are still relevant today. This talk tries to delineate and compare the characters of the ancient Roman and Chinese empires, especially the styles in exercising power and maintaining order. Many of these characters are still recognizable today. Why are they so resilient to the passage of time? To answer this question, we will turn to examine how these characters are shaped and entrenched in pre-imperial history. About four centuries before empire formation, Rome was a democratic republic, a nation of farmer soldiers. China was not a unified brand, but a collection of hundreds of tiny victims with polished aristocrats. The two realms eventually converged on empire under absolute monarchy. However, because the initial conditions were so different, they rose to empire by different paths and overcame many different obstacles on the way. Just as the childhood experiences shaped adult characters, the experiences of the rise shaped the characters of empire. We can regard the early struggle as developing cultural genes that adopted to changing environmental conditions but retained a strong core. The Western and Eastern core style can be symbolized by the dragon and the eagle. As the standards of the legions and the birth of the divine emperors, the Romans have made the eagle an emblem of power and empire. The dragon serves as a, single, a similar emblem in China. The old world of civilized, human civilization lies in the continent of Eurasia and Africa. At the beginning of the uh, uh, common era, the old world underwent an age of empires. Four great empires, the Roman Empire, Parthia, Kushan, and Han Dynasty of Imperial China coexisted and maintained some order. During the times, patchworks of long distance trades appeared which connected into the intercontinental Silk Road. Chinese silk reached Rome around the time of Julius Caesar, but through many intermediary hands. China and Rome were not direct trading partners. They sent no diplomats and never established any official connection. Because of the lack of interaction, I just compare them as isolated entities. The Roman and Chinese empires were similar in scale and imperial organization. Each empire ruled over about a quarter of Earth's population then, and the land area of each empire was about a little bit more than half of the land area of the United States. Each empire organized its territory into directly ruled provinces. At the peak, each empire had about 100 provinces and employed about 230 high officials for the central and the provincial government. Each empire lasted about five centuries before succumbing to similar fate. Half of each empire, the more important heartland half, fell to barbarians originated from beyond its northern frontier. The Western Roman Empire fell to uh, Germanic peoples from beyond the Danube and the Rhine and northern China fell to a nomads from the Mongolian steppe. 
no empire is forever. But it lasted. The Roman and Chinese empires share many similarities. The economies of both empires were varying, with agriculture making up about 90% of the economy. Trade and craft existed that were minor. Farmland was the dominant form of wealth, and the prestige of uh, landlords far surpassed that of uh, merchants. Compared to other agrarian, ancient agrarian economies, China and Rome were more monetized, with large circulation of metallic coins. This was especially so in Rome, where the large currency helped to maintain the peacetime professional <coughs> army. The Romans and the Chinese equally treasured the family and reserved much power for the head of family or clan. The societies were both conservative and stratified. Each person had specific social roles and were expected to be content, content with them for the order and harmony of society. Filial son, deferential wife, and obedient subjects were the common roles in both empires. Once, Romans in the Republic were also right to citizens, but that was history. Roman citizens in the empire had lost all political rights and were effectively subjects to the emperor, although as conquerors, they were privileged subjects. Both, emperor, both empires were absolute monarchies. The Roman Empire had inherited many characters of the Roman Republic, but not its democratic elements. The Roman Empire was similar to the Oriental despotism in that it lacked the rule of law. That is, it had no constitutional law that limited the power of the empire, emperor. No matter what the Roman Emperor called himself, the Greeks rightly recognized him as the autocrat, the ruler answerable to none. Also, the Roman Emperor was similar to the Oriental despot in that he was hereditary. No Roman Empire and no Roman Emperor who had a son alive was ever succeeded peacefully by anyone else. Now this point is often missed because some of the best Roman emperors, Augustus, Trajan, Hadrian, Antonin the Spies, they were adopted sons and in turn passed on the purple to adopted sons. But they did, but not because of some enlightened principle as sometimes suggested. They did so because they had no biological son of their own and were therefore forced to adopt. Actions of necessity prove no principle. Perhaps the only thing they can prove is that the Roman aristocracy had a problem with fertility. But that was never a problem with the Chinese. Uh, Darwinian consideration aside, the Roman and Chinese empires had many differences. Oh. One difference one difference showed up in a long perspective. Here are the Roman Empire and the former Chinese Empire superimposed on today's political map. You can see that China has survived and expanded, while the former Roman realm has fragmented into more than 30 pieces. Other differences are visible more close up. Both empires were absolute monarchies. But Rome was a military dictatorship, while China a bureaucratic autocracy. The most conspicuous feature of the Roman Empire was its large peacetime standing army. Designed to protect the Roman emperor's power, it turned out to be an emperor maker. China faced more foreign threats than the Roman Empire did. It preferred to call up troops when necessary during war times. Instead of a permanent army, the conspicuous feature in the Chinese government was its bureaucracy staffed by devoted civilians. An empire's character had much to do with the composition <coughs> and ethos of its political elites. In Rome, the elites were all wealthy landlords. By law, a person has to pass a very high wealth standard to be eligible for public life. Now, wealth was always advantageous in politics. In China, was not a criterion for government. 
There, the criterion is was a uh, ideology, namely Confucianism. Government officers were selected from the party based in the Confucian canons. So one power base in Rome was is well was well in China ideology. Now the elites treasured their property rights and upheld the law that protected the property rights. As I said earlier, as I said earlier, the Roman Empire lacked had no uh, constitutional laws that structured political power and the process of legislation. That is, the empire lacked the rule of laws. However, because the Romans generally respected existing penal and civil laws and regarded law abidance as a civic duty, Rome was ruled by laws. In contrast, even the rule by laws failed to take root in imperial China. The Confucian ruling elite preferred moral education, regarded the law as coercive and fit only for a corrupt world. The different attitude uh, toward the law was a great disparity between China and Rome, a disparity that's still visible today between China and the West. How did this disparity characters came about? For that, let's turn to examine the genesis of the empire. Here are the timelines for the Western and the Eastern world. The Chinese Empire began early. The year 221 before the Common Era was a turning point in Chinese history. China was unified for the first time. The Roman Empire came about more than a century later, and its beginning uh, uh, starting point uh, is ambiguous. I picked the year 49 BCE, the year that Caesar marched in Rome and started the civil war that destroyed the Republic and commenced one man rule. Before the Imperial Age, both realms had an exciting history of rise to empire. Uh, the foundation of the Roman Republic in 509 BCE is a good starting point for our story. Uh, on the Chinese side, the future emperor, empire builder, Qing, was invested as a state in the year 771. Qing was an upstart in the world of well-established states in China. The five centuries before empire formation in China was the most influential in Chinese history. It is traditionally divided into two parts. The first part, the spring and the autumn period, is named after the spring and autumn annals compiled by Confucius who, reached, who lived at the end of the period. The name of the, uh, the following period, the Warren's Day period, accentuated is violence. Not coincidentally, the late Roman Republic was also marked by large wars and violent struggles. Empires do not form peaceful <coughs> Our purpose is to com uh, compare two careers, compare who does what at what age. For that purpose, <coughs> the exact dates are not so important. So for the clarity of uh, illustration, I'll match up the starting point of the imperial era. So that so I'll match up the starting part of the imperial era so that we can compare their, uh, their relative developments. The imperial age in both sides began with a two decade long transitional period. This was the pivotal period most famous in the history of both sides. This was the time of the Roman Civil War, featuring Caesar and Octavian, Antony and Cleopatra. On the Chinese side, stood the first emperor, whose Qing dynasty united China. The Qing dynasty lasted only 15 years. We have established the architecture of the united China ever since. The Han dynasty that inherited the Qing inherited most of its institutions. So the historians mention the Qing Han dynasty together as the early Chinese empire comparable to the Roman empire. The two stories of rise to empire have very different storylines. The Western story features a single star, Rome. It's the story of a relentless Roman expansion 
with some stories compared to the growth of the United States of America. On the eastern side, the Chinese story does not feature a star until very late. China was an international arena with many states with comparable length, strength. This story is a story of a centuries of balance of power, which some historians compare to the history of modern Europe. The big difference is that the balance of tax, uh, power in China ended in unification. To build a large empire is not a very difficult task. Both worlds suffered centuries of warfare. To sustain large military expenditure for so long requires a strong economy. This was especially so in China, which, because, which did not depend as heavily as Rome did on massive looting and enslavement. Also, military conquest is only one step in empire building. You all remember President, President Bush's uh, boast after American troops took Baghdad in the Iraq war. Mission accomplished. Well, history proves as anything but that. The conquerors must be able to con govern the conquered people, and the political problem is often more difficult than military operations. Even worse, the political problem can blow back and hit the constitution of the conqueror itself. We will see that Chinese states in the Warren Day period underwent vigorous political reforms to build up a, a uh, government adequate not only to unify China, but to govern the subsequent empire by centralized bureaucracy. But the late Roman Republic failed at political reforms, so the city-state government proved increasingly incapable of uh, controlling the growing power of the army and the generals, leading to civil war and a military dictatorship. <clears throat> as, I, as I said earlier, the prominent feature of the Roman Empire was its war machine, its wealthy elites, and its respect for the law. A prominent feature of the Chinese Empire was its bureaucracy, its ideological elite, and its indoctrination machine. How did these characters came about for that, we turn to the beginning of their rise. The early Roman Republic was a nation of farmer soldiers, rustic and pragmatic. Not only commoners, but aristocrats share in this character, as is apparent from the iconic legend of Cincinnatus. Cincinnatus was a patrician uh, aristocrat who had served as consul. He labored in the field himself that readily took up the sword to defend his country. The early republic was not much into high culture. The Chinese state were. At the beginning of the Chinese spring and autumn period, the states, most of the states except Qing, had more than four centuries of history already. The aristocrats were polished courtiers who quoted poetry in political discourse and had rit uh, ritualized many practices. This is one of their ritual vessels. And the masters of ceremonies were the foreigners of Confucians. Well, the precociousness in high culture may not be a blessing for China, because it enabled many socioeconomic traits of their time to be locked in as cultural genes. Chinese aristocrats may be ahead in high culture, in terms of technological, <coughs> economical, and political development, China left far behind Rome. In the spring and autumn period, China was still in the late Bronze Age. Its main weapon was the chariot, which was monopolized by aristocrats. Bronze was expensive and was reserved for weapons and luxury items. Production tools were mainly made of stone and hard wood. The productivity of these primitive tools was so low, families would hardly save up enough to weather illness, drought, and other mishaps. So as an insurance, they grouped together in communal farms under the thumbs of aristocrats. 
Land ownership was undifferentiated from capital. Transferable landed property rights was a notion to come. It was a thoroughly aristocratic dominated society. This was the period that generated most of the confusing literature that will shape the Chinese mind for 2,000 years. Another sign, the Roman Republic at its birth was well into the Iron Age. Inexpensive and widely available metal tools elevated productivity and enabled family farms to generate enough surplus to not only to tie over hard times but to buy weapons. The economic base of the early republic was the small independent proprietary farmer who also constituted the self-equipped citizen infantry. Power emanated from the edge of the plowshare and the edge of the sword. The century long struggle called the conflict of the orders, the Roman farmer soldiers were one for themselves significant political power. Farmers who tilled their own land were the middle class in the agrarian economy. They treasured their property rights, regardless of protection, the major purpose of the state. Of course, the rich landlords couldn't agree more. So from the beginning, wealth and politics worked hand in glove, and it was reinforced by the common respect for the law. Not only in technology and economics, in political development too, China, the distance between China and Rome, was as great as that between China and the West in the 19th century. Loosely speaking, both were aristocracies, but they were aristocracies of a very different kind. The Roman senatorial aristocracy adhered to a tradition that can be called republicanism. The Chinese feudal aristocracy adhered to a tradition that can be called Confucianism. But the name is actually anachronistic because actually Confucianism is the heir, spiritual heir to the feudal aristocrats. To understand the two traditions, let us look briefly at two kinds of human relations, personal relations and social relations. Beginning from mother and child, person-to-person -person relations engage our emotions. Love and loyalty are the primary virtues of personal relations. They are the primordial bond of humanity and the ones that hold through hell and high water. <coughs> However, Personal relations are complex, short ranged and difficult to scale up. In a large society, a large and complex society, personal relations tend to form clusters with sharp in-group, out-group differentiation. <coughs> Another way to have cohere a large society is for unrelated persons, each to form some special bond to a special person, perhaps the emperor or chairman Mao. So this is a form of rule of man. From family and friend, patron and client, personal relations are ubiquitous in the world. The peculiarity of Confucian ethics is that it's almost exclusively based on personal relations. Even in political affairs are dominated by personal connections. It all pervades one Xi, the westerners found striking in China today. In this, the Romans were different. They also developed under the kind of relation. The social, uh, personal relations are warm, person, uh, emotional, and concrete. Under the way to uh, cohere a large society is more abstract and appeal more to cool reasoning. Reasonable negotiation, conflict resolution, and integration of consensus build up social institutions. Impersonal and impartial laws by which everyone abides, in consensus in which everyone immerses as individuals, no, no uh, links, no strings attached. Justice and fairness are the virtues of the social relations. They open up a new public dimension symbolized by the law and create a society similar akin to a three-dimensional world, which incorporates the public dimension and the two-dimensional plan of personal relations. The Roman Republic had a vibrant public space 
embodied in the um, forums of assemblies and the senate of aristocracy. There, Romans engaged in social relations and developed the idea of a commonwealth in which everyone was a citizen. This public dimension was non-existent in feudal China, which lived on the interpersonal plan. The laws and uh, traditions of the Roman Republic took, took two centuries of struggle to mature. The three elements of the Roman government, the Senate, the Magistrate, and the People's Assembly, checked and balanced the powers of each other. The Republican government of checks and balances has become inspirational for modern political thinking, especially in the framing of the United States Constitution. From today's viewpoint, the most peculiar feature of the Republican politics was its wealth qualification. Periodic census classified all Roman citizens into seven orders according to their wealth. The weight of a person's vote was proportional to his wealth, and only the most of the girls in the wealthiest order were eligible to become senators and magistrates. Together, the senators and magistrates constituted the senatorial aristocracy and adhered to a tradition of collective rule. Magistrates, including councils who commanded the legions and held kingly powers, were annually elected by the People's Assembly. Because the wealthiest citizens whose vote counted the most were also those who could afford the armament of heavy infantry, the annual election of magistrates were also the army electing its general. Therefore, the people and the soldier and army added as an arbiter for aristocratic competition. Strict laws restricted the terms of service and uh, ensure a wide distribution of honor and opportunity among the Roman aristocracies, so that no one's power searched too far ahead of others. The equality of aristocrats was the cement for senatorial collective rule. When equality was upset by Pompey and Caesar, the Republic was endangered. All Roman citizens respect the law. Legislation followed definite processes. The magistrates proposed the laws. The assembly heard arguments pro and con and returned an up or down vote. The decision to reject a law or pass it into a reject a bill or pass it into law was final. Formerly, the Roman citizens, the Roman people, was sovereign. They had unlimited power with their votes in election and legislation. However, whom and what they could vote for was narrowly circumscribed by aristocrats. They could only chose, choose from candidates who belonged to the wealthiest class and satisfied strict eligibility rules. They had no right to propose bills, no right to amend the bill proposed to them, and no right to speak singly in assembly. They could only listen to the debates arranged by the aristocrats and pass or reject a bill in its entirety. In this way, they are easily manipulated by aristocratic politicians. So therefore, although the Roman Republic was formerly a direct democracy, scholars find that in substance it was an aristocracy. Power was firmly <coughs> held in the hand of the senatorial aristocrats. Power was even more firmly held in the hand of aristocrats in feudal China. There, all ministries were hereditary, and most ministers were the representatives of the lords. Love of relatives and the deference to superiors, the twin supreme morals in the hierarchical society, were also supreme political principles. In a through the feudal passing of sovereignty, the king formally ruled over all the world, represented here by the large triangle. Effectively, the king actually ruled over only a small royal domain, represented by the inverted flag in the middle. The remaining territory he passed out to the lords, who were mostly his sons and relatives. 
The Lord served the king, but ruled his fiefdom almost autonomously. The Lord's fiefdom had the same structure as the kingdom, only on a smaller scale. So put to all together, the uh, feudal system resembled what mathematicians call a fractal. It exhibited the same structure at all levels. The peculiarity of the feudal pastoral sovereignty is the segmentation of authority and loyalty, here represented by the broken solid lines. The Lord owed loyalty to the king. The Lord's minister owed loyalty to the Lord, but not to the king. Conversely, the king's authority extended to the Lord, but not to the Lord's ministers. While a system based on segmented loyalty is prone to fragmentation, but it fits well with a system based solely on personal relations, essentially make the clustering of personal relations into a political institution. So the person's political thinking is essentially limited to his family or family-like circles. This is the heritage of the feudal China. In sum, uh, the feudal Chinese recognized only personal relations and personal virtues such, such as love and loyalty, while the Republican Romans also recognized uh, social relations and developed civic virtues such as justice and fairness. This difference had, enough, had significant consequences. The first consequence was the separation of state and family. Powerful Roman families, such as the Scipios, produced council generation after generation. Family prestige has such advantage in elections that some say the magistrates were almost hereditary. Even so, they had to win elections. Because, the Rome, because of the extra dimension in association, the Romans were able to draw a clear line between the public and the private, the state and the family. The public-private distinction was not existent in feudal China, where the state was undifferentiated from the family, and political loyalty was a simple extension of filial piety. The second consequence was the disparate attitude toward the law, the pillar of the public dimension. The Romans always uh, were always proud of their laws, and uh, regarded law abidance a civic duty and virtue. In contrast, the first publication of law in the Chinese states involved a vehement protest from Confucius. The impartiality and impersonality of the law appeared as a cold and callous intrusion into the warm world of personal relations, not to mention its challenge to the authority and prestige of feudal aristocrats. Generally, Confucian literati equated uh, the uh, Confucian literati regarded law as not complementary but antagonistic to the cultivation of personal virtues on which they pride themselves. In short, for the Chinese concentrated on the asymmetric personal relations of a hierarchical society, the role the Romans uh, legal and political institutions also nursed a strong public spirit, <coughs> represented here by citizen soldiers locking shields. Such are the legacies of the early Roman Republic and the late Bronze Age of China. The warring state period somehow resembled the 20th century, in which China caught up with the West. China passed into the Iron Age and its hundreds of victims collapsed into a handful of large states. The energy unleashed by technological revolution and interstate competition created the most vibrant environment in Chinese intellectual history. A hundred schools flourished, challenged diverse ideas, challenged Confucianism, which hanged government on the personal virtue of sages and aristocrats. Pragmatic innovators called legalists introduced the rule by law. They were public, reliable, and equally, uh, equally applicable to all. 
The leader's ideal of equality under the law was revolutionary. It tried to open up the public dimension similar to the Roman Republic. Unfortunately, it was way ahead of its time. He infringed on personal relations, he trod on the privilege of vested interests, and soon withered after the resurgence of Confucianism. <clears throat> among, all, <clears throat> among all Chinese thought, the legalist came closest to Western thought. Besides the rule by law, the legalist also embarked on state building and economic development. Reformers disentangled the state from the ruling family. To replace royal household management, he designed offices according to the service demanded of them and organized this office into an organization we call a bureaucracy. A bureaucracy is a hierarchical organization of offices, each with a definite job, authority, and responsibility. Unlike feudalism with a segmented authority and response, uh, authority, uh, bureaucracy had a chain of command which centralizes power and forges a sense of loyalty to the whole. Nobody likes bureaucracy. But among realistic options, the bureaucracy is the most efficient way of managing large enterprises. That's why all modern government and large corporations have bureaucratic structures. In this way, the legalist reforms in China were pioneers. Legalist reforms were most thorough in Qing and accounted much for its eventual victory. Qing reformers explicitly promoted the uh, policy of farming warfare. The state led land reclamation, water work, and other productivity enhancing programs. The state also encouraged small proprietary farms by systematically distributing land to individual families in return for tax and service in the infantry, which replaced chariots on the battlefield. Qing's farmer soldiers somehow resembled that of the early Roman Republic, except the Chinese king bought off the people by land and economic incentives instead of the vote in political incentives over, offered by the Roman aristocracy. By building up an uh, effective administrative process uh, uh, apparatus that's capable of uh, harnessing the prowess of thriving farmer soldiers, legalist reformers wrested power from the feudal aristocracy and concentrated it on the king. This is the social political structure of the Indian <coughs> chains unification of China. But China's were passed into a, an economy of small proprietary farmers. Rome was passing out of it into the slave mode of production. The Roman military enterprise was largely financed by massive looting and enslavement, which had distorted the whole economy. The small, proprietary, the small proprietary farmers came under severe pressure from large slave work plantations. Many lost their farms. The middle class collapsed. As economic inequality skyrocketed, politics polarized. Repeated agrarian reforms aiming to rejuvenate the middle class by distributing public land failed because of staunch aristocratic opposition. As more and more citizens lost their land and their ability to purchase arms, the draft faced difficulties. To fill the ranks, the government took over the responsibility of armament and the army turned to recruit volunteers from the poorest stratum of society. Return for the service, the volunteers demand land and retirement. Land was the livelihood of farmers. The elected officers and the vote in assemblies failed to deliver what they needed. Generals who were great power by force were war promising. Their allegiance killed the balance of power toward the generals. The enormous power and wealth brought by conquest stoked the personal ambition of aristocrats 
for command of the legions and government office uh, government of the provinces. The quality of aristocrats theater as competition among them skyrocketed. A government designed for checks and balance checked itself into paralysis, unable to solve the problems generated by imperial expansion. Ambitious oh. Well, ambitious uh, aristocratic generals seized the opportunities. Caesar manipulated assemblies to vote for him a 10-year uh, military command in which he conquered Gaul for Rome and acquired unprecedented power for himself. To suppress senators who opposed him, he fought the civil war that destroyed the republic. Caesar's dictatorship for life effectively started the monarchical age. However, even Caesar's genius had underestimated the strength of the Republic. His assassination led to more civil wars until uh, his adopted son and heir, Octavius, defeated rivals to become Augustus, the first emperor of Rome. When Roman emperors came to power, because of the dysfunction of Republican government. China's first emperor capitalized on a century of legal <coughs> legal reforms, which built up a strong government with ruled by laws and supported by strong economy. In less than a decade, in about the time the Caesar took the conquer Gaul, Qing here and next six rival states whose combined population of more than quintupled its own, and turn the map of China from this <coughs> to that in less than 10 years. Now, how to govern this uh, vast room? <coughs> Almost all the Italy's allocated, divided the new empire into kingdoms to be ruled by the king's sons and relatives, effectively pouring new blood into the old feudal bottle to create an old uh, land in a uh, country in the old fragmentary form. The long this uh, opposition came from a legalist minister with humble origin. He argued that this would just let uh, would just lead to a repeat of the warring states. The first emperor listened to the legalist and decided to abolish the feudal aristocracy altogether. No more hereditary kings, lords, and ministers. The new empire will be divided into directly ruled provinces with uniform structure and a uniform law. Provincial governors will be commoners, appointed and uh, dismissed by the central government according to performance and merit. <coughs> Unifying programs standard everything, standardized everything from the law, currency, weight measure to the writing script. This pivotal decision established the political architecture of imperial China and imprinted the idea of unity on the Chinese soul, both essential for China to reunify itself after fragmentations in the long ages to come. Well, it proves disastrous for Qing. Dissolving six states was uh, radical enough. Abolishing the feudal aristocracy is a war was even more disruptive. Embittered and high ruling class, whose dream was become, to become lords and hereditary ministers. If this further resented the laws that held them accountable for administrative performance and screamed cruelty when the emperor punished corrupt officials. The first emperor escaped three close court attempts on his life. This is a portrait of the assassination. His posthumous uh, reputation did not escape assassination. Civil war broke out after Caesar's death. Well, Caesar was 56 when he was assassinated. The first emperor was only 49 when he fell to some illness. Neither had prepared for the transfer of power. This was the biggest mistake. So civil war broke out after Caesar's death, put down, mowing down recalcitrant uh, Republicans. So rebellion broke out soon after the first emperor's death. The Qing dynasty collapsed. 
All aristocrats of the Warren State assert, reasserted themselves. Opportunists mushroomed. Four years of chaotic fighting reduced the entire country to ruins and produced a commoner on the throne as the founding father of the Han Dynasty, setting a tempting precedent for the ambitions of the future. The civil wars in both realms broke the backbone of the old aristocracy. On the other hand, the fate of Caesar and the Qing dynasty taught the heirs a lesson. The emperor needed the cooperation of the ruling elite to rule effectively. To placate the elites, Augustus hid his autocracy behind a Republican facade. The Han dynasty retained Qing's institutions that loudly condemned its rule by laws. Fearful of Qing's fate, the Han Dynasty revived the feudal aristocracy. But the new kings promptly realized the first emperor's worry of repeating the boring state violence. When the Han emperor suppressed them, few objected. The feudal aristocracy was finally abolished, <coughs> but had already bequeathed in spirit to Confucianism. The love of relatives and the deference to superior was far more agreeable to the ruling elite. There was the rule by law, which treated elites and ordinary people alike. To buy off the elite, the Han dynasty made Confucianism the state ideology, through which feudal ideals became characteristic of the dragon. Uh, the, uh, the, the bureaucratic uh, organization designed by the legalists was retained. Was ruled by law was blamed for Qing's demise and condemned. Confucian literati occupied the bureaucracy and replaced its operating principle of regulating efficiency by personal connections. It created the, perhaps the most effective and enduring indoctrination machine in world history. Using different slogans, a machine still operates today to underpin the dragon's soft power. Augustus and the subsequent emperors never let go of the mighty war machine by which Caesar grabbed power. Militarism had always been the spirit of the Roman eagle. However, the nature of the army changed. The Republican citizen militia added as a check on aristocratic power. But the imperial peacetime army was the emperor's tool to intimidate and suppress oppositions. Romans continued to respect the law, but the process of legislation became opaque, and the word of the emperor acquired the force of law. Augustus stripped power from the Senate, retained the senatorial aristocracy, and heightened its wealth qualification, so that only the extremely rich could qualify for government office. The silver cord imprinted with the emperor's image a symbolic of the eagle's hard power that unites economic and political interests. Uniting land north of the world was a secret to political success that the Roman Empire inherited from the Republic. It had a flaw though. Land is immobile and necessarily tied to local interests. However, the union of political and economic powers had become a cultural gene <coughs> They will flourish again when the economy produced another dominant form of wealth, capital. The evil had resource over today's global capitalism. The Roman and Chinese empires were glorious. However, we should not forget what they had sacrificed for the satisfaction of the ruling elite. Imperial China has sacrificed its nascent rule by laws. The ruling Confucian unit uh, equated law with punishment and smeared it with an odor of heartlessness. Instead of that laws, they appealed to personal morality in setting uh, policies. Even today, when the West argues with the East, you can still hear one thoughts in legal terms while the other one moralizes. The Roman Empire has sacrificed the Republic's liberty on with the democratic element in election, legislation, and civil rights. <coughs> Contrary 
could they say that all nations first gravity toward democracy? The Romans actually turned away from it. Democracy requires significant coherence among citizens. Coherence is easy to achieve when imperial expansion, economic growth, produces enough opportunities to satisfy most people. Unfortunately, good times are not forever. When acute economic inequality and political polarization led to intolerable bloodshed, the Romans finally chose disciplined stability over ruinous liberty. According to one myth, Rome was founded by Laius, escaped with the fire of Troy, bearing his old father. To his filial party, Confucius was full-heartedly identified. When all else failed, the primordial bond of family remained. Love and loyalty, these cultural genes are shared by the Romans, the Chinese, and all humanity, past, present, and future. Thank you.